it's tough yeah. because when they get to school, they're not signaling their parents anymore. Yeah. So a lot of parents think their kids are actually sleeping fine. Yeah. And they don't realize that they're spending e extensive periods of time in their rooms, not asleep. So unless we tackle this problem earlier on in the picture, it gets more and more entrenched and harder and harder to change and even harder to increase the parents' awareness about it because it's not infringing on their lives. And, that, and what they're finding in the U.S. is a lot of these kids have got televisions in their room. So what they do is, you know, if they, wake, if they get up in the middle of the night, just flip on the TV and spend, you know, nobody knows that they're doing that. Well, they need to pay a lot of attention to the sleep surface and what's in the bed. So they need a firm mattress. You can't go sleep on a soft mattress or on a water bed. They really should be getting rid of any soft pillows or duvets or things like that in the bed because those are all things that if an infant comes in contact with their face during the night, it can cause suffocation. They need to make sure that they're not on any medication that would cause them to go into a really deep sleep and be kind of unaware of their sleep position because some of what can happen during the night is there can be overlaying. And I found a really interesting page in a book that I was reading that was on risk and it was from London in the 1600s and they were talking about the death rate in London from parents overlaying their infants. So it's interesting because we tend to, when we talk about co-sleeping, we tend to hark back to Africa and hot and say, you know, everybody co-slept with their infants and that was the way it was and that's the way, you know, nature intended it. And, well, nobody goes back and looks at how many infants actually died while that was going on. And do they want to actually incorporate everything that's going on in those African villages or just the co-sleeping? Yeah, so it's making sure and then also saying that they shouldn't be exhausted when they're co-sleeping because they're more likely to fall into a very deep sleep and that's more likely to have a problem and they shouldn't be drinking and they shouldn't be taking any drugs and on and on. So there's a lot of factors. If you go on the Canadian Pediatric Association website, they don't recommend co-sleeping, but there are guidelines there for safe co-sleeping. And my theory is that a lot of women are getting antidepressants that probably don't need to get antidepressants, they just need to get sleep. And I really worry about treating people with antidepressants where it may be a matter of they're simply sleep deprived because antidepressants have effects on brain chemistry. And it's hard to know whether those effects actually go back to, or whether the brain actually goes back to the way it was before people were treated with antidepressants. And there was a study that came out recently that su actually suggested that mild to moderate depression shouldn't be really getting treated with antidepressants. It should be getting treated with cognitive therapy. And only in the cases of severe depression should we be treating people with antidepressants. So I think there's a lot of women out there who are being treated with antidepressants who are probably sleep deprived. And I think you're right. I think there's probably kids who are being diagnosed with ADHD and put on Ritalin who aren't getting enough sleep. And so we should be getting at the underlying problem that's going on. And, and it's not that easy to dis, disengage it because kids who have HDH, ADHD also have sleep problems. So it's, again, one of those things where we come back to, well, what's the chicken and the egg thing? But, you know, a lot of kids end up getting diagnosed with, I think, ADHD, where it may just be that there's some hyperactivity going on and it's not being well tolerated. So whether it's an actual ADHD diagnosis is another question, and that hyperactivity may be associated with sleep loss. That's a great question. So I'm sorry, because I, I kind of had to skim over that a bit. But um, basically what they're saying is that there are um, chemicals that are secreted during the night, and one of them is called ghrelin, and I, the other one is escaping me at the moment. And 
what happens when there's short sleep trajectories is they're not being secreted in the same way that they would be secreted if there was a longer sleep trajectory. And some of these things are actually appetite suppressants, and they actually affect the way that we um, use the calorie intake that we've had previously. And so the hypothesis is, although I don't know that anybody's actually tested it, it would be pretty, um, what's the word? invasive because you'd have to do blood testing to check it, is that these levels are being affected by these shorter sleep trajectories and then that's changing the child's appetite and their need for caloric consumption during the daytime. There's also a suggestion that the growth hormones are not being secreted in the same way over the sleep cycle because the sleep cycles are shorter. So the calories that the child has ingested aren't being used in the same way. And then if we add cortisol into the mix and the cortisol levels are um, elevated, cortisol interferes with some of those other chemicals that would be secreted in the body. So I suspect it's quite a complex biomedic or biochemical picture, but that's what they're thinking the biochemistry is. I, I totally understand that, and I, I understand we can end up marginalizing families. So I've, act, I've gone out and done some work um, with the group in Vancouver who works with families who are in contact with social services because there's ongoing parenting problems or whatever, and mostly these are poor families and they're families where there's probably been a history of substance abuse. And we've come up with strategies that they can use to promote sleep with their children, even when they're living in a bachelor suite. So and they're worried about their kids crying because they're worried about child apprehension, et cetera. So there are ways of dealing with it, but it just means that you need to be able to have contact with those folks and try and help them. And it's not always easy to get them involved in a study because they, um, as the workers who've been trying to get them to get into the Rocky Sleep Study have said to me, they, they are kind of fearful of research or study kinds of opportunities. So it's been hard to convince them to be, become part of that. But I've certainly done some one-on-one -on -one around that. There's like 48 books out there. But good ones. Well, the problem is every book tells parents something different. So it's a matter of individualizing. You have to really uh, individualize it. And, and you, ha you mean, we, our strategies that we present in the Rocky Sleep Study are a package, and, but what we do is we have a question and answer period at the end of our group intervention, and then parents can ask particular questions about their kid and the problems that they're having with their kid and, you know, how can they make these strategies work for them. So I think that's part of it. But part of it is, too, that most parents, they, they don't get any support around this, and it's all very well to read the books, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to try and actually implement what you're seeing in the books. What I found with the public health is um, I've been working with Vancouver Coastal for a long time now because they were involved in helping me recruit for the pilot study, and that got published in 2006, so that tells you how long we've been working on this. And because they're, they feel that there isn't good evidence for a particular intervention, the public health nurses are not giving parents advice about how to solve the problem. They'll, they'll give them a number of different approaches and say, well, choose from this variety of approaches which one you think might work for you. And I think that that in itself is a little bit difficult because often parents have been exposed to those interventions through reading and they're really looking for somebody to give them some specifics about, well, you know, how, how can I tackle this? And coming down on a particular way of approaching it. Yeah.